Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for January 8th, 2022. Uh, here we're uh, into Matthew chapter 3. So the whole of Matthew chapter 3 is our text uh, for this Sunday, January 8th. It's the first Sunday after Epiphany. So just after Epiphany, actually. But uh, so today we're looking at uh, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Uh, and his baptism of Jesus. So chapter three of Matthew's gospel introduces uh, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, or whatever you want to call him. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And here we see again, one of these formulas about uh, prophecy and fulfillment, uh, because Matthew says, this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So quoting Isaiah 40, uh, though perhaps a, a, a kind of alternate translation, because of course in Isaiah 40, uh, in the wilderness uh, seems to be part of the uh, quotation. So in Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying out, comma, quotation mark, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It's okay. A little bit of uh, difference of interpretation here. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, Isaiah, sorry, John looks a whole lot like some of the Old Testament prophets, right? He's, uh, or at least some of them, maybe not Nathan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe not even Isaiah, who's, uh, who's uh, a prophet and, and a priest, uh, who uh, is centered at the temple in Jerusalem. But John does look a whole lot like Elijah uh, and Elisha, the kind of itinerant prophets, uh, the the uh, gadflies uh, to the kings of Israel, uh, the, the troublers of the kings of Israel. Because John uh, wears camel's hair, he lives out in the wilderness. Uh, his food is locusts and wild honey. Uh, and he is a gadfly, right? You brood of vipers, he says to the Pharisees and Sadducees who come to hear him, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And then he he attacks their uh, idea or their uh, their pride in their ancestry. He says, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these very stones to raise up children to Abraham. So, Can I jump uh, in, Catherine? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, John. So it, it, it's, it's really just Elijah, in my view, that he is being compared to, because Elijah is an eschatological figure in first century Judaism. He's expected to come back before the kingdom comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, the it, In the Protestant order of the Old Testament, which preserves, I think, one of the Jewish orders, uh, uh, the Old Testament ends with Malachi. So the last verse, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And then yeah. he, what, what will he do? He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and so on. And then essentially you're getting the New Testament starting now with that, pro that prophecy being fulfilled. The eschatological figure, John the Baptist is in the role of Elijah. And, and then he does this. He, um, he, He's turning right hearts, um, and you, then you got to get into it. I mean, you gotta you don't go. You can't read, you brood of vipers, who warned you, right? You gotta. <laughs> this is fun. I mean, this is this is the best Shakespearean experts going to want this line. You know, uh, who warned you to flee? You know, and so on. That's kind of fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love it. Uh, I will echo uh, this idea of Isaiah, though, because while I fully agree with you, and I was going to lean into what you just said, Rolf, about Elijah, the words that are used here are the words of Isaiah. And uh, um, Catherine already mentioned that. So all these words of John, the, the, the baptizer, I learned to say it that way, have merely been the written words of the prophet Isaiah. 
Um, and um, it's, it's interesting if you're going to play with this. John was so compelling that, and his message so unique that the most vile of the community, the most influential, the most powerful, found themselves seeking to reap some of the benefits. And John responds with the biting confrontation. Okay, so maybe biting is a little wimpy of a word. Um, But John's accusation against them is to say, your identity marker of ethnicity and ancestry and heritage is not going to be an ace up your sleeve. Mm -hmm. And with echoes again of Isaiah, John speaks of judgment, of being cut off, which just sets us up for Jesus and Paul talking of being grafted in to abide. Okay, I got to stop because now I'm getting way ahead of ourselves. But I, I just love that that image if we stay in the wilderness and stay in that promise. Yeah, and it's worth noting uh, what you uh, uh, to add to what you two have already said that John is explicitly connected with Elijah later in the gospel. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 11, which doesn't come up in our lectionary reading. So you could uh, you could refer to that as well in your sermon for this week. But uh, Jesus, uh, speaking of John the Baptist, praising John the Baptist, says, "Quotes Malachi. See." I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Uh, And then he says from the days, uh, sorry, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. So uh, John the Baptist in the Gospel of Matthew is explicitly connected with Elijah. uh, And so he's, uh, he's an important figure uh, in this gospel, at least in the uh, in the beginning, but and uh, he knows that he's not the Messiah, right? He he is Elijah. He's he is this eschatological figure prophesied in Malachi, who will come uh, to uh, to to you know prepare the way for the Messiah. But he says explicitly himself in three eleven, uh, "I baptize you with water for repentance." But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And sure enough, that's what happens then in the latter part of this chapter when Jesus comes to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John, of course, uh, famously says, uh, you know, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answers him, let it be for so now for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, and so then you get uh, the baptism of Jesus. So in your sermon, of course, you can concentrate on one or the other or both of these events. But this idea of John uh, as Elijah, uh, uh, preparing the way for the Lord, preparing the way for the Messiah, uh, and or uh, the baptism of Jesus, where we see the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And then, of course, this beautiful uh, verse at the very end, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So lots of rich stuff to deal with this Sunday, and you can uh, you can pick what you uh, would like to talk about. I just want to say a word, this, uh, this is my son, the beloved, or this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, uh, would evoke, I think, for um, uh, for for Hebrew uh, hearers, for for Jews, uh, would evoke some stories from the Old Testament. I think particularly of the sacrifice of Isaac mm-hmm. in Genesis twenty-two, where God says, "Take your son, your only one, whom you love, and offer him here." So, uh, in that case, Abraham was not uh, required to go through with offering his beloved son. Uh, this, I think, may be echoes of that or uh, kind of a, a foretaste of what will happen to this beloved son. There's a, a scriptural imagination of uh, that has made that interpretation uh, repeatedly where folks uh, make that illusion and bring, bring that scene together that, um, as one uh, songwriter said, um, um, God has done what Abraham was asked to do. Mm-hmm. He's given his only son. 
and uh, it, it's it's almost um, it, at that that verse uh, thirteen where where Jesus comes. It's almost as if Jesus is validating the very words of John, um, where where John has said, "Your heritage is not." Uh, going to be your ace up your sleeve, as I said a moment ago. And, and Jesus, um, God incarnate, God in the flesh, comes and says, baptize me. I mean, if if God in the flesh says, I need to be baptized, then clearly I can't say I don't need to participate in these rituals or practices um, because I'm, you know, a descendant of, or my ethnicity is, or my bank account says, or I'm just a nice person. Um, there's something about these rituals and practices that form community. I mean, that that's what we do. We do these, I, I, I used to teach at Duke, and at, at Duke, it, when the freshman class comes in, they learn how to participate in all of the uh, Cameron Stadium chants uh, for rooting for Duke basketball. That's how they become a community. They have these rituals and they know how to practice them. And, and so Jesus is actually validating these words of, of John by saying, yes, baptize me so that all is fulfilled. And it, again, it's almost as, as if um, God is making a promise to us. Not only does God desire to walk with us, but God has humbled himself to demonstrate what it means to follow and following in the practices and following in the rituals that form a community who evidently bear the mark of the Holy Spirit upon us. And those are those words that this, this ends with, where that voice from heaven says, this is my son, the beloved with whom I'm well pleased.